Hi everyone, Mrs V here and today we are going to be looking at nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We're going to be looking at how you get clues about the structure of an organic molecule from an NMR spectrum. No time to waste, let's get started. In this tutorial we will take a very simple look at the principles behind nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We will look at carbon-13 and proton NMR and we will learn what information we can gain from chemical shift values, integrations and spin-spin coupling. Learning to interpret NMR spectra will give us information about the structure of the hydrocarbon part of a molecule. Let's start by talking about what magnetic resonance is. If you held a compass needle and forced the north arrow to point to south, then as soon as you let go the needle would swing back. That's because it's a much more stable or lower energy state for the compass needle to align with the magnetic field. Changing between those two positions is called resonance. Some nuclei with odd numbers of particles, like hydrogen 1 and carbon 13, are known as half-spin nuclei. And these nuclei can act like tiny magnets. It turns out that energy in the form of radio waves can make these tiny magnetic nuclei flip to align against the field. This is a higher energy state. Of course, what goes up must come down, so once that energy is removed, the nuclei will flip back and they'll give off the extra energy they had absorbed. In nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, a magnetic field is applied to the sample. The nuclei will be aligned with the magnetic field. A very short burst of energy in the form of radio waves is applied to flip the nuclei to oppose the magnetic field. The energy that's released when the nuclei flip back can be recorded and graphed. In carbon-13 NMR, the nucleus that's being flipped is carbon-13. This is only about 1% of all carbon atoms, but remember a sample contains maybe millions or billions of carbon atoms. Now the electrons that are in the bonds around the carbon atom can actually reduce the effect of that magnetic field that we are applying in the spectroscopy. This means the nucleus can be flipped with less energy. We say that the carbon-13 nucleus is being shielded from the magnetic field. If the carbon's bonded to a very electronegative atom though, the electrons are going to be dragged away from the carbon-13 nucleus. Now the carbon-13 nucleus is going to feel much more of the effect of that magnetic field that we're applying, and it's going to take more energy to flip the nucleus. We say that the carbon-13 nucleus has been de-shielded because its shield of electrons has been dragged away. The recordings on the graph or the nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum will appear at different places depending on how much shielding there is. The x-axis of the graph is chemical shift or delta. It's measured in parts per million or ppm for short. This corresponds to the energy or the frequency of the radio waves that are absorbed when the nucleus flips. Chemical shift increases as the energy needed to flip the nucleus increases. The scale goes backwards, it goes from right to left. So further to the left means more energy was needed. This is called downfield because it's further from zero. A de-shielded nucleus, that is one that's bonded to a highly electronegative atom, will make a peak downfield. A shielded nucleus, one that's not bonded to any highly electronegative atoms, will make a peak upfield or further to the right. The chemical shift of all peaks is compared to the peak made by tetramethylsilane, or TMS. This is assigned a value of zero. There's nothing particularly special about TMS. It just makes the most upfield peak you can get. Nothing in that molecule has a high electronegativity or a very polar bond. The good news is that chemical shift values for different carbon environments can be looked up. When we say a carbon environment, we mean what that carbon is bonded to. Is it part of an ester? or a methyl group, or maybe an alkyne. All these will produce different chemical shift values. If two different carbon atoms are making peaks with the same chemical shift, then we know they're in the same carbon environment, so they're bonded to the same atoms. The four methyl groups in TMS are all carbons that are bonded to three hydrogen atoms and a silicon atom, so they are all in the same environment. Let's look at an example. In ethanol, one carbon is bonded to two hydrogens and oxygen and another carbon. The other carbon is bonded to three hydrogens and a carbon. 
two different carbon environments, so we would be expecting two peaks on the spectrum. Here, we see this is true. But which one is which? Well, remember, being bonded to a highly electronegative atom like oxygen makes the peak appear more downfield. So this carbon must be making this peak. The other carbon is just bonded to carbon and hydrogen, nothing too electronegative there. So it will make a peak more upfield. What about propanol? There are three carbon environments. This carbonyl carbon is going to be super deshielded because it has two bonds or a double bond to the oxygen. So that's the peak that's really downfield. The next carbon along is going to be a little bit affected by that oxygen because the electrons in its carbon to carbon bond are going to be sucked toward that oxygen. It's going to be a little bit deshielded, but nowhere near as much as that carbonyl carbon. Its peak will be a little bit downfield. The carbon on the end is going to stay shielded. It's too far away to get deshielded by the oxygen, so its peak is going to be the furthest upfield. We're going to look at hydrogen 1 NMR, or proton NMR now. The proton NMR spectrum is incredibly useful for determining the structure of the hydrocarbon part of an organic molecule. There are three main sources of information in the spectrum. They're called chemical shift, which again is the proximity to electronegative atoms. The integration, which tells us how many hydrogen atoms are causing that peak. And splitting, which tells us how many neighbouring hydrogen atoms there are. The good thing about chemical shift is that it works exactly the same way as it does for carbon-13 NMR. The closer a hydrogen atom is to a highly electronegative atom, the further downfield its peak will be. You can look up the chemical shifts in a data book again, so you know what type of hydrogen you're looking at. TMS is still used as a reference. Its chemical shift is zero. Let's look at an example. Here's the NMR spectrum for ethanol. Now a proton NMR looks really different to a carbon-13 NMR because of the peaks being split into sub-peaks. We're going to talk about that later. The bits in green here are the integrations, and we'll talk about them next. Right now, let's try to match the peaks to the different hydrogen environments just using chemical shifts. There are three hydrogen environments. The hydrogen in the hydroxyl group is bonded to an oxygen. The two hydrogens here are in the same environment. They're bonded to a carbon that's bonded to a carbon and an oxygen. The last three hydrogens are in the same environment. They're bonded to a carbon that's bonded to another carbon. The hydrogen in the hydroxyl group will have the most deshielding. It will be the most downfield. The hydrogens in the CH2 are pretty close to that oxygen, so they'll be fairly deshielded too, but not as much as the hydroxyl group hydrogen. They will be a bit downfield. Finally, the hydrogens in the CH3 are furthest away from the oxygen, so they're still pretty shielded, and that peak is going to be upfield. Let's move on to integration now. Integration tells you how many hydrogens are making that peak. It's determined by comparing the area under each peak. In ethanol, the hydroxyl group hydrogen has an integration of one because that's only one hydrogen. The CH2 has an integration of two for two hydrogens and the CH3 has an integration of three for three hydrogens. Usually integrations are one, two or three, but if a molecule is symmetrical, there might be lots of hydrogens in the same hydrogen environment. In 2-methylpropan-2-ol, the hydrogens in the CH3s are all in the same environment. They're all bonded to a carbon that's bonded to another carbon. The hydrogen in the hydroxyl group is in a separate environment. So in the spectrum, the integration one with the higher chemical shift is the hydroxyl group hydrogen. Then the three CH3s are making that lower chemical shift peak with integration nine for the nine in the three CH3s. The last piece of information, and it's incredibly useful, is the splitting patterns or the spin-spin coupling. This basically tells you the order of the CH3s or the CH2s or the CHs in the molecule. Each peak gets split up by its neighbors. The hydrogens on the next carbon atom split the peak into sub-peaks. The n plus 1 rule says that the number of sub-peaks is equal to the number of carbon to hydrogen bonds on the next carbon atom plus 1. And that means you have to consider both sides. So in ethanol, the OH peak is not split. That hydrogen is only bonded to oxygen. It's what we call a singlet. The CH2 is next to a CH3. 
so it gets split into three plus one, or four peaks. This is called a quartet. The CH3 is next to a CH2, so it gets split into two plus one, or three sub-peaks. This is called a triplet. Let's put our proton NMR skills to the test. This spectrum doesn't have integration, so we'll just work with chemical shift and splitting to match the peaks for butan one ol Five different hydrogen environments to make five main peaks. What would we expect? The hydroxyl group hydrogen. We'd expect a really high chemical shift and no splitting. Here it is. The next CH2. It's pretty close to the oxygen, so you'd expect a fairly high chemical shift. And it's next to a CH2, so you'd expect three sub-peaks or a triplet. Here it is. The next CH2. We're getting further from the oxygen, so we're getting lower chemical shift. It's next to two CH2s, so we would expect four plus one or five sub-peaks. Here it is. The next CH2 along, a bit further again from the oxygen, so lower chemical shift. It's next to a CH2 and a CH3, so five plus one is six sub-peaks or a sextuplet. Here it is. Finally, the CH3 on the end. It's quite far away from the oxygen, so we'd expect lower chemical shift. It's next to a CH2, so we'd expect two plus one is three sub-peaks, so a triplet. And here it is. Now it's your turn. Here's the spectrum of pentan 2 own. Pause the video and match the hydrogens to their peaks. We'll be back with the answer in a minute. Here are the four hydrogen environments. Nothing is directly bonded to an electronegative atom, so we're not seeing any super high chemical shifts. These two are close, so they would have the higher chemical shift. Now the integration gives away which one is which, but let's go through the splitting just for fun. I know, I need to get out more. This CH3 has no next door carbon to hydrogen bonds. So we would be expecting to see a peak of integration three. It would be a singlet and it would have a fairly high chemical shift. Here it is. This CH2 has a CH2 next door. So two plus one gives us a triplet. We'd expect a triplet of integration two with fairly high chemical shift. Here it is. The next CH2 has a CH2 and a CH3 next door. So five plus one gives us a sextuplet. Our integration is two, and we'd expect to see a lower chemical shift. Here it is. Finally, the CH3 has a CH2 next door. So two plus one gives us a triplet. Integration of three, and the lowest chemical shift because it's the furthest away from the oxygen. Here it is. How did you go? Have you mastered the nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum? Well, I hope you found that video useful. If so, please give it a like. And as always, please subscribe to my channel, watch more videos, learn more about this wonderful subject of chemistry. I'm going to see you guys in the next video.